When people travel to the African continent to go on safari, most probably think of herds of elephants, a cheetah silently on the move, the iconic acacia trees, a journey of giraffes softly blinking their big eyes, the stillness and wildness of majestic birds about to take flight. And it is all of those things. But this is not a story about those things. This is a story about why all those things are possible. For the next nine days, we would be on assignment with Roar Africa, a company which creates custom carbon neutral travel itineraries using only partners chosen for their positive impact. We would be visiting two areas of Kenya, not just to show the incredible landscapes and animals, but to satisfy a deeper longing of mine, to highlight the often unseen people who dedicate their lives to protecting and preserving wildlife and wild places. We landed at Segura on a cloudy afternoon in July. This 50,000 acre private reserve in the Laikipia region of Kenya is one of Roar's favorite properties as it's a testament to the resiliency of nature. Not that long ago, this dry, dusty area was barren with almost no wildlife due to overgrazing of cattle. Now, 15 years later, after a lot of care and revitalization projects, wildlife are once again returning. Hundreds of thousands of indigenous acacia trees have been planted using biodegradable containers and water recycling systems as part of their Tree of Life reforestation project. We were excited to meet our guide Paul, who over the course of the next five days would be giving us a deeper look into the conservation world than most guests get to see. Paul has been a field guide at Segura for the last four years, helping guests better understand the natural world. And he was a ranger for the 12 years before that, helping to manage wildlife. The barracks were our first stop, where our new class of ranger recruits were undergoing a refresher course mandatory every few months. Keeping wildlife safe from poachers and other human-wildlife conflict means employing the latest technology, keeping up to date on court decorum, doing community outreach, and creating systems to track and collect data on wildlife movements to see how forces like climate change and human encroachment are affecting their habitat. After dropping in on their classroom lessons, we watched their endurance training exercises, then went on a perimeter patrol in the blistering sun. For the next 21 days, this is their life, often waking up at 4 a.m. to get their training started. exhausted just trying to keep up with them while filming and we weren't even doing the drills. What stood out to me was how excited they were about us being so interested in what their daily lives are like and what motivates them. They kept thanking us for being interested and we kept thanking them for being the ones doing an incredible job. At the end of the day, I think we all want to feel seen for the work that we do in this world. And what I love about filmmaking is you get to remind people that their story matters. Soft spoken and always smiling, it was easy to initially think Paul was born to work with guests. But before guiding, Paul spent 12 years in the field as a game ranger, conducting anti-poaching operations and training new recruits like these ones. As the days went by and we got more comfortable with Paul, he opened up about how a life spent protecting nature was the most rewarding path for him, but it wasn't always easy. And I dedicated my life to protect the wildlife. I would spend nights, days, months without seeing my family, without seeing my friends, without having, you know, a break. You would walk, you would patrol in the night with rains, you get sick. I mean, all sort of things. It's not a fancy thing to do, but 
it took me the dedication the passion and the lifelessness because we really wanted to have these animals thriving at peace and for our generations to come to be able to see them so we were like fighting to stop extinction Paul told us about the years he spent sleeping out in the bush while protecting wildlife a lot of what he has witnessed and has gone through can't be spoken about because it's still sensitive information and could be dangerous if it got into the wrong hands. It was really hard for me to understand how serious the war on poaching is until I was on the ground hearing stories firsthand about how political and far-reaching and just real it is. Another interesting story, uh, rhino poaching is surging across Africa as tourism and crucial funding plunge. A strong anti-poaching message on poaching, something that is still out of control as it gets increasingly sophisticated. But rhino poachers are upping their game and now posing as tourists. 672 rhinos at least have been poached this year. That's more than South Africa lost in 2012. After so many incidents over the years, he's rightfully very careful with whom he shares his story. He said that in those 12 years, he never used to smile because he was always serious and alert. So it was such an honor to hear his story and get a first-hand look behind the curtain to a world not many see. Although he's only a few years older than I am, I felt like a child next to him with all he's done and the wisdom with which he carries himself. I found myself asking him a lot about what legacy he feels he leaves behind after spending the last 16 years in conservation. See, I'm so, so proud of myself because I never held the skills Head from conservation by myself, I shared with others so that conservation can continue long after me. Yeah. You can see this legacy living all around him. It's hard to see a place that Paul hasn't touched or isn't actively tending to. The next day, Paul introduced us to the canine units, which he helped to train for a live demonstration of their tracking abilities. He has also trained hundreds of rangers in the field all over Kenya, and he was instrumental in supporting the formation of the all-women's anti-poaching unit here at Segura. As a person trying to find my own deeply rooted purpose in life, I was curious about what made him take this path and how he stayed motivated through it all. I mean, conservation is everything, and so it has no beginning or the end. And so for people like us who dedicate their life to conservation, we know it means a lot for even the coming generations. Stopping conservation is stopping life. Paul's father was also a ranger, and he felt like his dad gave him the greatest gift by taking him on those early game drives. He also inspired his brother, who just graduated that day as a ranger. As we walked with the rangers, Paul said a part of him misses that life and likes to give the new recruits words of encouragement because he knows how challenging it can be to stay with it. The next day, we said goodbye to Paul and the team at Segura and flew south in a private bush plane to the open grasslands of the Maasai Mara. Roar Africa makes travel so easy as they take care of all the details of planning and transfers so I can really concentrate on the experience of being here. In Swahili, Ngama means suspended in mid-air, and that's exactly how it felt being perched on their deck overlooking the legendary Mara Triangle below. In normal years, this is Kenya's most visited protected area, famous for its high concentration of wildlife and the annual wildebeest migration. The sheer abundance of animals in the Mara region is unlike anywhere I have ever been. Every year, nearly two million animals, mostly wildebeests and zebras, traverse this area in the largest migration of wildlife on Earth. Witnessing the Great Migration is often called a waiting game because it's hard to predict when the herds will decide to move. 
We pulled up to the edge of the Mara River where the guides thought the wildebeest would cross for the day. We got super lucky and not five minutes later, we could see one wildebeest break off from the herd. No one quite knows why or how it happens, but some sense of urgency, of instinct, propels it forward when no one else wants to press on. Dust clouds bloomed and the sounds of thousands of hooves striking rock and charging through water hit us like a wave. It was a symphony of water splashing, grass being trampled, and the urgent call of zebras jockeying for position. Minutes later, the endless line trickled to a halt and all was quiet again. One of the first things our guide Sophie said to me is that she loves the Mara the most because it might be smaller, but it's richer in wildlife. And it's so true. I felt grateful to be here during this week to witness the migration, but even without that experience, the Mara Triangle has held by far the most animals I've ever seen on any safari over the years. I see why people travel from all corners of the earth to come witness it. Sophie actually grew up not far from here and is from the Maasai tribe. Through walks with the Maasai naturalist and many days spent with Sophie, we learned Maasai culture is very patriarchal and culturally still very rooted in their pastoral heritage. Women are typically in charge of housework, raising children and tasks like collecting firewood and often not favored for education or job opportunities. Although these things are changing, Sophie is still in the vast minority of women guides working in conservation and tourism. Her mother actually wanted her to be a nurse, but Sophie knew that guiding was the path she wanted to take. After graduating from the Kyoki Guiding School in the Mara, she was accepted into a six-month intensive program in Tanzania. The first two weeks of training are called the selection course, and it's very tough. After a cup of coffee and one slice of bread, they got into the field for 12 hours, equipped with only water, their books, and a bag filled with six kilograms of sand. They have to carry the bag of sand throughout the whole day, learning endurance, teamwork, and how to stay composed under stress. I was like really focused because I was telling myself, I don't want to fail in this. This is what I've been dreaming to do in my life. Now, I don't want to fail myself. I don't want to fail my family. I don't want to fail those people that they were telling me that you can't do it. Sophie has been guiding for so long now that I feel she exudes this quiet confidence and a steady watchfulness. She loves being a mentor to others. Sometimes on her leave from work, she told us how she would visit the primary school or the college she graduated from, and she'll talk to the girls there and give them courage and confidence. She believes that if they want to be guides or doctors, she wants to be an example to them that they can do these things as long as they work hard and believe in themselves. Sophie has actually been on a previous Roar Africa women's empowerment trip where Roar flew her to Segura, the property we just left, to uplift and give advice to the newest female guide on their team. This is a male-dominated field. For us ladies, I think we have to do more and you have to have that confidence because actually if you don't have that confidence and many people they don't believe that as ladies we can do it. As Sophie spoke it was hard not to reflect on the similarities between her story and the great migration we had just witnessed. It just takes one to lead, one to create momentum to shift the whole herd. Bravery is contagious and this act of showing each other what is possible really matters. Sophie and others like her are paving the way for future generations of girls in the Maasai culture to know that they too can have a voice and a place in conservation. Reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. You must be brave with your life so that others can be brave with theirs. I leave Kenya with a profound appreciation, not just for the spectacular wildness of nature, but also for the quiet fortitude of people who dedicate their lives to making sure it stays this way. Traveling with Roar Africa gave me a glimpse behind the curtain of your average game drive and really connected me with the people who translate the language of the natural world to us temporary interlopers. I want to leave you with a lesson Paul told me one windy afternoon. Everything in the natural world has value, even a rock. To us, it's just a rock, but to an animal, it might be a home, a scratching post, a hiding place. 
So just because we can't see the value doesn't mean it's not there or not intricately connected to every other part of the natural world. And how we treat the natural world is but a reflection of how we treat ourselves and how we treat one another. On this trip, I felt like I was renewing the lens of my life through Paul and Sophie as my portals. They're still so enamored with the natural world, not some epic filtered version of it. I realized how much even my heart, as grateful as it is, has been somewhat jaded by always skimming the surface of these beautiful places. There's so much depth, they notice, from a life spent looking. And it made me wonder how the rest of us can get there without giving so much of our lives in the process, if it's even possible. Conservation and women's empowerment will happen and need to continue happening across the globe with or without tourism. But what we can do as conscious visitors is to look for opportunities to support this work being done. We can utilize organizations like Roar Africa who put these values at the heart of their ethos. And above all, we can simply be curious and express appreciation when traveling. Take time to put down the camera, your expectations, and really ask questions. You never know when listening, when one conversation can change a person's life, including your own.